Dr. Burge would like to know, do you ever get Sunday sickness? Morbus sabbaticus, better known as Sunday sickness, is a disease peculiar to some church members. The symptoms vary, but these are generally observed. It never lasts more than 24 hours. It never interferes with the appetite. It never affects the eyes. The Sunday newspaper can be read with no pain. Television seems to help the eyes. No physician is ever called. After a few attacks at weekly intervals, it may become chronic, even terminal. No symptoms are usually felt on Saturday. The patient sleeps well and wakes feeling well. He eats a hearty Sunday breakfast. Then the attack comes until services are over for the morning. The patient feels better and eats a solid dinner. After dinner, he takes a nap then watches one or two pro football games on TV. He may take a walk before supper and stop and chat with neighbors. If there are church services scheduled for Sunday evening, he will have another short attack. Invariably, he wakes up Monday morning and rushes off to work feeling refreshed. The symptoms may not recur until the following Sunday unless another service is scheduled at the church during the week. Jesus had every right not to want to go to synagogue. He was surrounded by religious hypocrites, yet he never got a case of Morbus Sabbaticus. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 tells us that his custom was to go to synagogue every Saturday. Would you turn it to Luke chapter 4, please? Jesus' ministry to the northernmost region, which, by the way, Nazareth was part, is summarized in chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, as being spirit-filled and highly acclaimed. This morning, let me ask you this. Why should you put out your welcome mat to the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to life and ministry? Why should you... Take the time to let Jesus know that he is welcome in your life to rule it as he sees best. Luke chapter 4, let me read this account to you, beginning in verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on a Sabbath day and stood up to read. As he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah... And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. And gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at his gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. And that's some uh, hometown welcoming, is it not? Would you join me in prayer? Father, I want to put out the welcome mat today to you, to your blessed son who evaluates each of our hearts. 
Father, to your Holy Spirit who dwells in each believer here. Father, to one that we ask today to open up our eyes that we might behold beautiful things from the word of God. Father, further to welcome Matt is put out for all the angels. 1 Peter 1.12 says they desire to look into the things of the gospel. And then, Father, we know as well that even the demons are interested in the Christian life because we are called to be displayers of the manifold favor of God. So, Lord, today as the welcome mat is out, we look for you to do spectacular things. Help us to come to appreciate and love you so much the more as a result of what we are now to study. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus returned home, and may I say to you, it must have been something going home. There was a spectacular view if you went up on the hill there in Nazareth. If you look just out to your east, 15 miles away was the beautiful Sea of Galilee. Due west, 20 miles, you had the beautiful blue Mediterranean Sea. And then the rise of Mount Tabor just was five miles east. And then, and this got my attention when we were in Israel uh, back in 1993, you look up to the northeast and there is Mount Hermon snow-capped most of the time. Can you imagine? being the one who had created all these things, but also just as you're growing as in your humanity, drawing near to God and seeing them. So Jesus goes home. And what does he do on the Sabbath day? The one who is the very word of God. He goes to synagogue. Proverbs 22, 6 says it this way, my friends, and don't miss this. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Joseph and Mary were very diligent to fulfill all the law. They had given Jesus even the right kind of training when it came to worshiping God. The now famous teacher was at the synagogue and was asked to read the scripture. When you read the scripture, you stood up. And then traditionally, when the rabbi taught, he sat down. We do not know if Jesus picked this portion of scripture or it was handed to him, but he was given the scroll and it then was rolled out. It's not a book like we have today, a codex with pages in it. It would have been rolled out. And in verses 18 and 19 explains Jesus's ministry during his first coming. Let me read this to you and I'm going to take you to Isaiah 61 in just a moment. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captors and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Notice where the quote ends, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You got that etched in your minds? Just for a moment now, go to Isaiah chapter 61 with me, please. Isaiah chapter 61. This is the portion of scripture that Jesus quotes from. But I want you to see as he quotes that he ends at a particular place. But what is the background to Isaiah chapter 61. Because you'll notice here in verses 1 through 2a, the same words I just read to you that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 4. But then notice now in verse 2, everybody there, Isaiah 61 in verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? Specifically, what is the background to that very statement? And we're going to see in a moment. It relates to the celebration of Jubilee. Jubilee. So in one sec, we will go back to Leviticus and see where this uh, passage derives from. But notice here what Jesus did not say in verse 2. Look at verse 2 again to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, but notice the very next part of the verse, and the day of vengeance of our God. May I point out to you in that one verse, it talks about both comings of Christ. The first one is to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 
But when he comes back the second time, you know what it'll be for? It'll be a day of vengeance. It will be a day of wrath. That's pretty fascinating. Now, back to Leviticus with me, please. Chapter 25. Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And focusing now on the expression to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I want you to understand clearly that Jesus' first coming was all about salvation. It was to set the captive free. It was to give deliverance. In Leviticus chapter 25, picking it up in verse 8, 25, 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Did your math there? Let's continue, verse 9. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound. Now, the word jubilee literally means blowing the ram's horn, and you'll see why in just a moment. It goes on to say here, when would the trumpet be sounded? On the 10th day of the 7th month. In other words, in the 50th year, coming up to that 50th year on a day of atonement, Yom Kippur, that you would have the trumpet blown at this particular time. And then notice in verse 10, it says, and you shall consecrate, separate, dedicate the 50th year and proclaim what? Liberty. Throughout all the land, to all its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. Do you understand that this is when the slaves were set free? Can you imagine the excitement for one moment? That when you, if you will, were in bondage, maybe because you were in debt, so you were an indebted servant or slave, and this 50th year rolls around, and all of a sudden the, the trumpet is blown, and you're told, go home. You're set free. Your debts would be released at that point. As Jesus is standing now in the synagogue, and he reads Isaiah 61, the backdrop to all of this was jubilee, because it was a time when the prisoner was released. That is why Jesus did not read in Isaiah 61, and the day of vengeance of our God. The second coming will be a time of vengeance, but the first coming is all about salvation. It's about the debts being paid. It's all about the prisoner being set free. Let me give it to you in two verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But then what does John 3, 17 say? What does it say about the first coming of Jesus Christ? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Are you jumping up and down in your hearts over that? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to call you out and say, hey, sinner, go to hell. He came to offer forgiveness. He came to bring release of debt. Do you understand that as Jesus is in the synagogue that he is letting everybody know in no uncertain terms that this is a time of salvation. Why is this significant? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Let me just give you a taste of the second coming of Jesus Christ and how you will, if you have the Lamb of God, how he will become the lion from the tribe of Judah. I want you to understand that today is a day not only of salvation for you, but it is a day that we proclaim salvation to others. So if you will, forget the sulkin spirit. Forget the past mistakes. Forget all the debt that you owe to God and even forget all the times that you blew it spiritually. Because Christ came that we might have life. And what kind of life, child of God? A life more abundantly. To understand that even in the Christian life, when we blow it, when we have sinned, when we displease our God, John would say it this way, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. 
But if we sin, we have an advocate. An advocate is not somebody who is against you. An advocate is someone who is for you. And if I'm an individual that have had my sin forgiven, then I want to do backflips. Because God has taken my sin as far as the east is to the west, and he has removed it. And he knows that even when I stumble and I fall, that I have this advocate waiting to pray on my behalf that I might stay in a right relationship with God. That's what the first coming of Jesus Christ is all about. But make no bones about it. For those who don't believe on Christ and those who go through the tribulation period and those individuals who experience, if you will, the second coming of Christ, it'll be far different. Look at Revelation 19, picking it up with me, please, in verse 11 to give you a taste of the judgment to come. Now I saw, this is the first of eight dramatic scenes to close out the book of Revelation, introduced by the two Greek words, Kai, Adon. Then I saw, now I saw, heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. This isn't the imitation Christ of Revelation 6. This is Jesus Christ. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Boy, we could camp there forever. Faithful and true. So if I go back to 1 John 1, 9, after I've sinned, he's faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me from some unrighteousness. How we slap God in the face and think that his love and his forgiveness is an all-encompassing. He's faithful. He's true. And in righteousness, notice what he does now at his second coming. He judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, diadem, kingly crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood because he had just slaughtered his enemies as he goes up from Basra down in the south, moving northward. Guess what happens to the enemies? With that two-edged sword in his mouth, he wipes them out at Armageddon. So his very vesture, his garments are now dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, that's us coming back with him, and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. That's not the God I want to have against me. <laughs> That's not the God I want to say, hey, I want to be opposed to you. Your arms are far too short to box with God, I'm telling you right now. And when he comes back the second time, it's going to be the judge, not his first coming. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Supreme King, and Lord of Lords. I love this. I love the concept that I, as a child of God, am part of the first coming in the sense that it is a day of salvation. How awesome it is to know that we are received by our Lord and now get to proclaim that salvation to others. And we wonder why Satan tries to mess our lives up. We wonder why he wants to play with our heads, don't we? Because he doesn't want us to proclaim this awesome message of salvation that the first coming brought. As you cling back to Luke chapter 4, it's the acceptable year of the Lord. But can I tell you something about Jesus? He knew he wouldn't be received. He understood that the very people that he was coming to would reject him. They would turn their backs on him. Does everybody see in verse 19, this is chapter 4 and verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord? Acceptable comes from the Greek word dektos. We find it also in verse 24. It's the concept here of a favorable decision of the will. In other words, it's when we come to Christ, we make a favorable decision toward him that we're going to embrace him, we're going to welcome him. If you will, we're going to put out the mat for him. That's what is being given here. But guess what happens in verse 24? Where is no prophet welcomed in his own home? Welcomed, same exact word. Jesus was rejected by the very people he came to, personified, oh, tremendously, 
through his own hometown of Nazareth. We're going to see that they actually tried to kill him. So there's no welcome mat put out to the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1.11 says it this way. He came to his own place, and his own people did not receive him. No welcome mat. So in verse 20, he closes the book. And can you imagine this, everybody? Every eye is fixed on him. The word fixed means to strain or to stretch. It has an intensifier. Can I put it to you in modern terminology? Their eyes were bugged out. Every eye in the place is now fastened on the Lord Jesus Christ. How amazing is that? And this is what he says in verse 21. And can you imagine this is little Jesus who grew up under Joseph and Mary. This is what he says. Today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am the one. I'm the individual who now will fulfill this to bring the acceptable year of the Lord. Here's our first point. Welcome. Jesus who offers salvation and fulfills scripture. Welcome Jesus who offers salvation and fulfills scripture. Let's probe a little further concerning this acceptable year of the Lord. What was it that Jesus was offering even his homies in Nazareth? Isaiah chapter 49, back to the Old Testament for just a moment. I want you to see these things for yourselves. Isaiah chapter 49 is one of the servant songs. It's speaking about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and his growth and development in his humanity. Isaiah chapter 49, everyone. Let me pick it up to you in verse 8 and see if we can find a familiar word there. Isaiah 49, verse 8. Thus says the Lord in an acceptable time. See that word? They didn't welcome him. It was the acceptable year of the Lord. It is an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of salvation I have helped you. This is speaking about the future kingdom. Because when Jesus Christ came to his hometown of Nazareth, and all of Jesus' first coming was about initially offering the kingdom to Israel. He says, I'm your king. If you receive me, I will set up my kingdom that was promised to you. That's what this passage is picking up on here in Isaiah 49. Because you'll notice here, he speaks about the covenant to his people, verse 8. To restore the earth, sounds like the millennial kingdom, to cause them to inherit the desolate places, verse 9, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth, to those who are in darkness, show yourselves, they shall feel, feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on the desolate heights. Pick it up in verse 10. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them, even by the springs of water, he will guide them. Jesus came to offer the kingdom. Jesus came to say, I'm your king. Fall down and receive me, and I will set up the promised kingdom. But they didn't receive him. And that's why we have the church of Jesus Christ today, because the church is the result of Israel's rejection of the king. Now, to see how this works out in the New Testament, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So in some ways, aren't you sort of glad Jesus was rejected? <laughs> because he had to make this prediction in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And the church was born in Acts chapter 2. And guess who's part of the church? Not just the Jews. We Gentiles as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul was being harassed by Judaizers, false teachers, claiming that you needed to now keep the law and don't, don't just trust in Jesus Christ alone, but we need to keep the law. 6.1 6, says it this way, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't get saved and then turn to a system of works. Verse 2, for he says... Here's the quote, remember from Isaiah 49? In an acceptable time, same word we saw in Luke 4, in acceptable time I have heard you, and a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. 
And you see where it says we're accepted time? It's kairos. It's the accepted season. I want you to understand, everybody, and what is given to you and me today is that we have a mission from God. And don't ever misunderstand this, that the people that are not reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ go to hell. They will be in hell, tormented day and night, forever and ever and ever. So we have been given a trust to reach out to the lost, to bring them a message. Why can we do this? Because it's the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time when we go to the young people, when we go to our friends, when we go to our neighbors, when we go to our coworkers, when we go to our communities, when we go throughout the country and throughout the world, we say, believe on Jesus Christ, because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that if you will turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will save your soul so you don't need to go to hell. Do we understand this is why we are here? Not only to have fellowship with God, but to make him known to everyone. And do not just pretend in your family relationships and with your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers that everything is fine. It's copacetic. It's not. If they don't know Jesus Christ, they will have an eternity apart from God in a place where the fire never goes out, external punishment, and the worm never dies, internal torment. And it is incumbent upon us to walk with God, to stay close to him, that we might proclaim him as the day of salvation for everyone. Oh, we get caught up in the politics of it all. And we watch this stupid government. Excuse me, can I say that? Stupid government. People who just want to keep their office and power and control. Like they really have interest in us. Are you serious for one moment? If they had care for us, they would live by our same standards. They would understand what we are going through. And maybe not get a paycheck when everybody else might not get one. See, I think Satan has been so masterful because he's taken a child of God and instead of us understanding the importance of preaching Christ and by changing hearts, and you want to deal with the abortion rate in our country, I'll tell you how you deal with it. You lead people to Jesus Christ. Do you know how you change the homosexual movement in our country? You lead people to Jesus Christ. Do you know how you deal with poverty in our country? You lead people to Jesus Christ. So now we start to take our bread and we break it and we give it to the poor. Now we pray for our government and we're commanded to do so when we submit to our authorities. But I want to tell you something. You are out of your cotton picking mind if you think our government is the answer. And you do a great disservice to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because there's only ever one answer. And he is the one. And he has commissioned us to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And this is what we are called to be. And this is what we are called to share. So what do we do? Number one, we welcome Jesus who offers salvation and he fulfills scripture. You want to find out about a politician, simply just go look up his or her promises. And you find how many of them are, are broken. I don't care if they're white or black, Hispanic or Asian, if they're green with polka dots, if they don't align with the scripture, if they're not true to their word, then that is not the individual that we put our trust in. We support people that are given to righteousness, who understand that they will stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who only has eyes like a flame of fire, who only can look in the human heart, who's the only one who can keep a soul from hell. That's who we look to. And our second point is this. Welcome Jesus who offers salvation to all. To all. At first, there is Jesus in verse 22, and he has spoken. And oh, how I would have loved to have been at his feet 
to hear the master teacher. And as they're hearing him at first, they're marveling at him. People are awestruck by his words. In verse 22, they marveled and they bore witness of his gracious words. But then all of a sudden, <laughs> the tone starts to change. And they said, they kept on saying, is this not Joseph's son? They become offended. You know why they're offended? Because somebody who grew up in a nowhere town, Nazareth, someone who labored with his hands as either a carpenter or a stonemason or both, that individual is sitting here telling us that he is the fulfillment of Scripture and they are offended in him. My friends, we don't need to be offended because just because someone shares a message with us, we know who they are. John the Baptist was in prison. Remember Matthew 11? The man that was the outdoorsman. And all of a sudden, he's sending his disciples to go find out if Jesus is the real deal. So what does Jesus do? He gives sight to the blind. He heals people. He does incredible things. And you know what Jesus said then to John? Don't be offended in me. In other words, when we follow Christ, it's not the bed of roses. It can be a life of suffering. It can be a life of hardship. But I'd rather be in hardship and suffering with Jesus than in a lap of luxury without him. Don't be offended in him. Don't stumble over who he is. First Peter tells us, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And Jesus knew what the people were thinking because there was a proverb, physician, heal yourself. In other words, take your own medicine. We had heard what you had done at Capernaum. Jesus spent 18 to 24 months at Capernaum, which was 20 miles away from Nazareth, and he had done many miracles. And you know what they're basically saying? You want to salvage your reputation? Come here and do some incredible things in Nazareth. That's what they wanted him to do. And that's when he said, a prophet is without honor, except where? In his hometown. Jesus was no different than the prophets who had come to their own people before him. He makes a statement in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. And Jesus doesn't leave, if you will, well enough alone. You know, at least they marveled at him. They said he has gracious words, and then all of a sudden Jesus says, I know where your heart is. Let me expose your hearts. There are three periods of miracles in history. The first one was under the time of Moses. The second one is what we're studying in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ under him and the apostles. But you know when the third period of miracles existed? Under Elijah and Elisha. So Jesus says, let me tell you about them. See, he's drawn a parallel with his own hometown. He said, think about Elijah for just a moment. There was a famine in Israel for three and a half years. But to whom was Elijah sent? To one of his own hometown people? No, because they had little faith there. He was sent to Zarephath in the province of Sidon to a Gentile. And these Jews, oh, oh. You know, and I, I'm just telling you, I'm just so sick of it. You know, if you got white people who only tout white causes, or if you have black people who only tout black causes, or if you have Hispanics who only tout Hispanic causes, see, anybody know what I'm saying? You know, if we're one people, if we're one blood, then we need to leave, live as people that are one people, one blood, and we just see who our neighbor is, and if he doesn't look like us, but he has a need, then we meet that need. See, so what happens? Elijah gets dispatched to a widow woman, but she's not Jewish. And then how about Elisha, the second great man of faith, who worked double the miracles of Elijah? There's Naaman the Syrian. How many people in Israel had leprosy back there in Elisha's day? I'm sure many. Oh, I'm sure many. But where does Elisha minister? To Naaman the Syrian, the Gentile. So before, the people are now marveling at Jesus' gracious words, and they're standing there with their eyes fixed on him, and all of a sudden now, in verse 28, they're filled with wrath. He's just exposing their hearts. 
He's allowing to come out what was there the whole time. You see, what the issue was in Nazareth was they didn't have faith. Israel didn't have faith in the Messiah. So Jesus says, I'm going to go broader than that. In the rejection of Jesus Christ in his first coming, coming to the Jews, he says, okay, you don't want me? We're going to open this thing up. I'm going to create something they didn't hear about in the Old Testament called church, and I'm going to reach Jew and Gentile alike. So there's no welcome banner to Jesus. They said, hey, we want to take you on a little walk up the brow of the hill. And we don't know if the idea was just to push him over to kill him or whether they wanted to take him there and then pick up stones and stone him because they considered him to be a false prophet. But this is what they wanted to do to him. An attorney tells a story of a man who died. And this uh, barrister, this attorney, said to his wife, he did not leave a will. So we need to know what his last words were. She says, I really don't want to tell you what the last words were. The attorney said again, ma'am, you know, he didn't leave a will. We need to know what his last words consisted of. She's still standoffish, and he goes, for the last time, ma'am, I really need to know what his last words were. She said, okay, I'll tell you. You don't scare me. You couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with that old gun. <laughs> she got caught, needless to say. The Lord Jesus Christ wasn't like that husband. And I love in verse 30, and maybe this is another miracle, as all the people are gathered there to kill him, guess what he does? He goes right through the midst of them. So what are we to learn? Two things. Welcome Jesus, who offers salvation and fulfills scripture. When I say welcome, I mean really welcome. In Luke chapter 10, we have the story of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Home is open up to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Martha has a lot of serving going on, because seriously, can you think about it for a moment, particularly ladies? Would you give your house to white glove test if you knew Jesus was coming to supper? Would you make sure everything was just right? Might you work a little more diligently to have the perfect meal prepared? And Martha is consumed with the service. But where do we find Mary? I'll tell you, choosing the better part. Sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them had a welcome mat out. But Mary really had a welcome mat out that said, Lord, I want to learn from you. I want to know you. I understand that you are my priority. Can I ask you all, is that your welcome mat? Do you truly understand who this is who is waiting to invest in our lives? Do we comprehend that this is the one who offers salvation to everyone and he wants to have not only a personal relationship with you but work through you so that we can proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord to others, that God's power might be manifest through you and me. And we wonder why Satan and his demonic hordes go through all of society and say, hey, let's get so wrapped up in politics. Let's get so consumed with this law and that law. And listen, there's nothing wrong with being involved in politics. There's nothing wrong with being salt and being light, but you need to maintain integrity and you need to show yourself strong. But don't give me this inept thing. I vote once every four years. Big deal. Don't many? We need to all do it, but there's something much greater that is entrusted to you and me. We need to proclaim Christ to this lost world, and we need to look at the very people who are opposed to what we believe and say, that person needs the Lord. You can't be pro-homosexual. You cannot be anti-God who created one man and one woman for life and think for one moment that that person really knows the Lord. Because if that person knows more than God, then that person should be God. Or with abortion. Hey, let's make him late term. Let's let them almost take the little babies out of the womb and just smash them on the spot. We put our hope in people like that at times. And Jesus Christ would be offended because he always had time for the little children. And can I tell you, even for the little children that no one wanted. He always permitted such. And of such are the kingdom of God. Do you really have the welcome mat open? Have you really allowed God to, if you will, come into your life and totally take control? 
to say, I trust you and I know that you are God and I want to be a man or a woman who walks with you, who meets with you daily, like Mary, who has a tremendous relationship with you because that's the important thing. So I get my marching orders from you when I go. And then we welcome Jesus, and you better get this, everybody, who offers salvation to all, to all. The older I get, I just realize just how racist people are at times. Whites look down at blacks, and blacks look down at whites, and we give all these stereotypical labels, and we forget the powerful grace of God. That God can save a soul and take anywhere from point A and bring them all where he wants them to be. And we forget that it's our God who sent his son not to die for just some people, but to die for every man, woman, and child who have been born, are being born, or will be born on planet Earth, to have a universal heart that says, my God is awesome. I need to replicate that heart in me so that I have a heart for all people. And if my own people won't listen to me, then I'm going to go find somebody else who will and offer them what Christ has told me to share with them. Do you have that kind of universal heart? Are we individuals who have to welcome that out and we're quick to look for an opportunity to proclaim Christ. 